on April 16, 1963, a grieved and stressed Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. sat in his jail cell and wrote a letter to his fellow ministers pleading with them to respond to the call of the gospel with love and justice in action. He wrote honestly expressing his frustration and pain with white Christians who would not stand with him in the cause of justice. He wrote as a churchman to the church these words, in deep disappointment I have wept over the laxity of the church, but but be assured that my tears have been tears of love. There can be no deep disappointment where there is not deep love. Yes, I love the church. How could I do otherwise? But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as a relevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. And even in his pain and his frustration... Uh, Dr. King wrote as a brother with a heart of love and charity. He ends his famous letter to the Birmingham jail this way. If I had said anything in this letter that overstates the truth and indicates an unreasonable impatience, I beg you to forgive me. If I have said anything that over- understates the truth and indicates my having a patience that allows me to settle for anything less than brotherhood, I beg God to forgive me. I hope this letter finds you strong in the faith and also hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me, for me to meet each of you, not as an integrationist or a civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman and a Christian brother. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-trenched communities. And in some not-so-distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail was one of the most famous letters written in American history. Its message resonated with the nation then, and his message continues to resonate with us today. The thrust of Dr. King's message was to communicate how the church was supposed to be a community of love and brotherhood. Uh, The church should not be divided due to ethnic differences, but united in the common bond of Christ. The church is defined by their love for Christ and for one another. So Dr. King longed for unity within the church and for, for hatred to be swallowed up in love, for the day when the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Beloved, we, as God's people, as the church, are called to shine as stars in a dark world, so that the world out there would know our Christ. The Apostle John, like Dr. King, looked at the church in his day, and he was frustrated and grieved with the lack of love he saw among those who claimed Christ. So he also wrote a letter to the church. There's a group in Ephesus that decided against love for the body of Christ, choosing to hate the brethren and leave the body As we look at John's letter written to the church and to us, I hope we'd be encouraged to love one another and to cast aside the dark stain of hatred and truly know who we are in the Lord Jesus. There's three things I think John wants us to see in this section of Scripture. He's writing to us about, first, the light of life, the light of life. Uh, If you were to have lunch with a friend and go home and ask your spouse asked you, what did you talk about? Uh, you're probably going to say two or three things that summarize the entire conversation. You talk for an hour, but you only have two or three things that you really talked about. Uh, Well, the letter that John writes to us is kind of like a lunch conversation. There's two or three themes that continue to kind of come up in our conversation. And as we see these themes, I pray that we'll be able to examine them kind of like from many different angles, like a a jeweler examines at different uh, angles of a diamond. Look at 1 John 2, verse 7. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So John appears to contradict himself by saying he's writing an old commandment, 
and then immediately changing, calling the old commandment a new commandment. John doesn't specify exactly what that commandment is, but based on the context, it's pretty clear that it's referring to our command to love one another. Uh, the old commandment is the, to love one another is, is not new for John's readers. Uh, they heard it from the beginning. The beginning in John's gospel usually is referring to the beginning of Christ's time on earth uh, when they first learned of Jesus Christ. Now, at the time of John's writing, the incarnation of Jesus Christ would have been, in the mind of John and his readers, long past, probably written 30 years after Jesus has, had gone to glory. Uh, the message of the gospel to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus, trusting in his death and resurrection as the only hope for salvation, proved itself in the ethical command in loving one another. Now, last week, we looked at the first test, the test of morality. If you are walking in the light, you would show yourself to be a believer. Uh, this is a, a similar test, but not specifically morally, but socially. One shows themselves to be a follower of Christ in how they love their brothers and sisters in the church. A lot of what the whole epistle of 1 John is, is kind of an unpacking of one of Jesus' statements in the Gospel of John, John chapter 13, 34, and 35. A new command I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so also you are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, Jesus calls the command to love one another a new commandment. The new commandment to love one another is not like the old commandment to love, but the new commandment to love in Christ by the power of his spirit. Now, we can kind of see this in how Jesus kind of reinterprets the law, the Sermon on the Mount, calling his followers to, to love with a supernatural affection. So in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and following, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Hear me, church. Christian love is new. It is new because Jesus, the light, has come. See, John centers his, centers his command to love on the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus has brought in a, the new age or the, the last days, the, the messianic reign of the Messiah, where God's people will be indwelt by the Holy Spirit to be able to show a supernatural affection for one another in radical self-sacrificial love. This is the, the promise that was fulfilled in Jeremiah 31 that we read earlier, that one day God's people will have the, the law of God written on their hearts and expressed in love towards the body. The darkness or the present evil age is passing away, for the true light is already shining, John says. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus shines into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus demonstrated his great love for us that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Jesus is the epitome of love, and his love overcomes the darkness. Jesus has dawned on the darkness like the rising sun which slowly extinguishes the night as it climbs into the sky. The love of God was clearly seen in Jesus Christ during his life and how he treated people, how he treated the, the sexually promiscuous Samaritan woman, how he treated the, the greedy extortionist Zacchaeus, how he treated the, the vile murderous thief on the cross, how he treated even those who, who were to crucify him, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See, the love of God is seen in Jesus, and the love of Jesus is shined into the world, ushering in the new age of the Messiah, which will overtake the darkness. The new age, the age of Christ, the age of radical, self-sacrificial love of God's people is true in Jesus, and it is true in the church. The church 
will show a radical self-sacrificial love to the world and how they love one another. So the question for us, is your life, is your love dominated by a radical self-sacrificing style? Is this new commandment to love one another true of you and true of us as a body? So the first thing we see is we're writing to you about the light of life. The second thing John is writing to us about is writing to us about the lie of darkness. The lie of darkness. The early church was not perfect, right? There was false teachers, harsh divisions, grievous sin in the body of Christ. Uh, the church at Ephesus experienced a bitter split, maybe the first church split in history. Uh, people were walking around the community, back into darkness. John confronts the lie of those who have returned to darkness, returned to their old ways, and an appeal to those who may be tempted to follow their example. Look at verses 9 through 11. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Light, darkness. Love, hate. Christian, non-Christian. Saved and lost. There is a dividing line here that John gives us. But we have a hard time seeing that in our day. We live in a post-truth age. Truth is relative. Everyone has their own truth or what someone says or believes is their own reality. So if I were to say I'm, I'm seven feet tall and have jet black hair, you would all look at me and say I am, I'm lying. No matter how much I believe that I was seven feet tall, no matter how much I believe that I had jet black hair, the reality is that I don't. It's very clear to see. But that's not how our world works today, is it? If you think something, if you believe something, that is your truth. But John is making it very clear to us. We cannot merely claim things with our words. You know, we are in election season, and we find candidates making true statements, and they're quickly fact-checked as lies. We are in an age of fake news, never really knowing what is true or false. John is teaching that there are some claiming to know Christ and be in the light, but, they're, but with, after a quick fact check, their lives in reality were still in darkness. So John is writing this to us to really ask us, we need to fact check our own lives. Are we in the light? Are we in darkness? Are we following Christ in the love that we have for one another, or are we hating our brothers and sisters? The test for Christianity is linked to your love for the church. You may claim to know Christ, but if you do not love what Christ loved, his church, how can you truly know Christ? The life of Christ was shown in a radical self-sacrificial love for sinners and for the church. Is your life characterized by self-sacrifice or self-protection? By giving to or taking from others? By love or hate? This test that John gives us is the test that Dr. King was giving the church in that letter that he wrote in 1963. Listen again to Dr. King's words. I have heard numerous Southern religious leaders admonish their worshipers to comply with desegregation decision because it is the law. But I have longed to hear white ministers declare, follow this decree because integration is morally right and because the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churchmen stand on the sideline and mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I have heard many ministers say those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. And I have watched many churches commit themselves to completely otherworldly religion, which makes a strange, unbiblical distinction between body and soul, between sacred and secular. I have traveled the length and breadth of Alabama and Mississippi and all other southern states. On sweltering summer days and a crisp autumn morning, I have looked at the South's beautiful churches and their lofty spires pointing heavenward. I have beheld the impressive outlines of her massive religious education buildings. Now hear me here. Over and over, I found myself asking, 
What kind of people worship here? Who is their God? Where were they when Governor Wallace gave a clarion call for defiance and hatred? Where were their voices of support when bruised and weary Negro men and women decided to rise from the dark dungeons of complacency to the bright hills of creative protest? Yes, these questions are still in my mind. In deep disappointment, I have wept over the laxity of the church, but be assured that my tears have been tears of love. There can be no disappointment where there is not deep love. Yes, I love the church. How can I do otherwise? See, what Dr. King was saying, he looked at the church, he looked at their love that they had for one another, and he saw it lacking. He did not see love. He did not see brotherhood and community. He looked at the church and asked, what kind of people worship here? Who is their God? Beloved, the world is looking at us. It is watching our Twitter feeds. It is watching our Facebook posts. And it is asking, who is their God? Who do they worship? Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. Listen, I've been deeply saddened in how I see those who claim to be in the light walk in darkness and how they treat the body of Christ. Have we lost our witness? The world is watching, and what do they see? Do they see a, a, a people loving one another, or do they see people filled with hate and division and strife? And more than that, if someone looked inside your own heart and saw your thoughts of the body of Christ, what would they see? Remember the Lord's command to us is not merely to love outwardly but from the heart. We are called not only to love those who are like us from the same political party or ethnic heritage. We are called to love all people with an empty tomb affection. Because Jesus Christ died and rose again and sent his Holy Spirit in us, we now have the power to love like no one else with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that, so that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. For if you love like those who look like you, what reward do you have? The tax collectors. The world does the same. Our love does not bring us to the light. Rather, it proves that we belong to the light. Beloved, God is purifying his church. In John 15, uh, God is the, the vine dresser. He takes his shearers out and he prunes the vines. Listen to what Jesus says in John 15. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it be more, bear more fruit. So it's two things that are happening here. The Father cuts off those who hate and are in darkness, for they do not belong to the light. But he also cuts and prunes those who are in the light, that they may love more and bear more fruit. Every cut hurts, but every cut has a purpose. We have to allow God to cut us to the heart every time we walk in darkness so that when we come back to the light. Listen, one of the challenges in this day and age is that we have a hard time admitting and confessing our sin. And when we confess our sin, we, we do it half-heartedly. We have, to, we have to let God cut us to the heart and admit where we sin against God and where we sin against one another so that we can have a deeper love for one another. Because we have a deeper love for one another, what does the world see? The world sees Christ. The world sees the supernatural resurrected people who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. This is not small potatoes. This is big time stuff for the people of God. You ever try to walk around the house with the lights off? You know, I wake up really early on Sunday mornings and uh, I try my best to be quiet, to make sure Ellen can sleep. Uh, and far too often I run into something because um, I can't see. And can we just be honest for a second? There is no pain like a stub toe, right? The only way to avoid stumbling is to turn on the lights so we can see where we are going. What John is trying to do here, he's trying to turn on the lights so we can love. Whoever hates his brothers in darkness and walks in the darkness does not know where he is going because darkness has blinded his eyes. Darkness is used two different ways in John's epistles. One, it's kind of like doing darkness, kind of like doing evil deeds. 
The other is kind of like the round, you're in an in a, in a area or a realm where sinful behavior dominates. If you're surrounded by sin, thinking about sin, allowing sin to influence you, you you're going to be blinded and deceived. You're going to walk in darkness if you surround yourself with darkness, and you will not be able to walk in the light. Darkness wants to blind you. So turn on the light so you do not stumble away from the truth. The third thing that I think John wants to, is writing, us, writing to us about is the life with God. Writing to you about the life with God. It seems like there's kind of an abrupt turn in verse 12. He shifts his focus off of the negative behavior of those who are hating their brothers and sisters in the church and reminding the church of their special status and relationship they have with God. He also switches from prose to poetry. Just notice this when you're reading the scriptures, how the Holy Spirit inspired the writers to change from prose to poetry. Prose kind of appeals to reason. Uh, poetry appeals to, the, to emotions. Uh, because God doesn't want, God and John does not only want to appeal to people to know the truth, but to follow it. Not only to understand it, but to live it. Look at verse 12 through 14. These are, it's a beautiful poem. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. After kind of charging the church to self-examination and how we are loving one another as a church, he shifts to encourage them, to remind them of what God has done for them in Jesus Christ. The whole book of 1 John is to give us assurance that we know God. And but we know God, we know God, we know His Son, Jesus Christ, and therefore we have eternal life. But he wants to remind us that we are not saved by what we do or how we love. We are saved by Jesus Christ, who is from the beginning, who offers forgiveness on account of His life, death, and resurrection. He addresses three groups here, children's, children, uh, fathers, and young men. Uh, some have interpreted this as three different groups in the church based on this, their, their spiritual maturity. Uh, children would be immature believers, fathers uh, are, who are mature, seasoned believers, and young men maybe who are, who are growing. It may be appealing to read it that way. I think probably more accurate is it's John is addressing children, right? When he addresses children, he's addressing all believers. We see that in 1 John 2, 1. He does that throughout the letter. Uh, children is always referring to um, all the believers in Christ. And then those who are fathers, who are probably referred to those who are more advanced in years, young men, those who are uh, younger. Uh, so he, he's writing this epistle, epistle to, to tell the whole church, those who are older and those who are, who are younger, uh, that they belong to the Son and they have eternal life. He provided us a test in 1 John 2, 7 through 11. Now he wants to remind them of the assurance that they have in Christ. So as we move towards a close, let me make five quick applications from this section. Five quick applications. Number one, uh, everyone has sin, and everyone has been overtaken by the evil one. If you are not a follower of Christ, we want you to know that there is a way to forgiveness. But before you know the way of forgiveness, you have to first realize that you need forgiveness. The Bible is clear that we are all sinners, and all of us have, have to pay for our sins, our world may not seem just, it may seem out of order, but God is just, and a just God will always punish sin. At the end of history, when Jesus Christ returns, or when you meet your maker in death, you will have to answer for your sin. We sin because we have hearts that are inclined to sin. We have hearts that are bent on evil. We need a new heart. When we when I say we need forgiveness, I, I'm really, we, need, we need a new heart. God needs to take our, our dead heart and make it alive in him. We sin because we have been captured by the evil one to do his will, 1 Timothy 2.24 says. See, Satan lies and it deceives us to think that the way to happiness, that sin is the way to happiness. But if you chase after sin, you will only be left empty. The evil one never makes good on his promises, which is the second application. Forgiveness is offered in Christ and in Christ alone. Anyone who repents of their sins and turns to Jesus Christ, the Lord will be forgiven. We are forgiven for his name's sake. To be forgiven for someone's namesake means uh, on the account of his name or on the account of what he has done. 
What has Jesus Christ done for sinners? He has become the propitiation for our sins, but not our sins, only the sins of the whole world. If you trust in Christ, Jesus Christ will take the wrath of God for you and give you his righteous life. Beloved, if you look at this salvation, this wonderful salvation that Christ gives, you are saved and forgiven on account of his name. We are not saved based on how well we love. We are saved because of the object of our love. Jesus Christ died for us. Jesus Christ was raised for us. And now he lives with us by the power of his spirit. So, beloved, rejoice that you have forgiveness. Those of you who have yet to bow your knee to Christ, I pray that today you would repent and trust in Christ as Lord. Number three, we have overcome the evil one. We have overcome the evil one. One of the lies that the evil one gives is that we will never be able to overcome temptation and sin. I know that there are some of you here today who have fallen into temptation this past week. Maybe it was you fell to anger or lust or greed, envy, hatred. You, you came to church this morning feeling the weight of your condemnation because of your sin. If you are in Christ, hear me. Take heart. Jesus Christ has overcome the evil one. And as he's overcome the evil one, so have you. You belong to Jesus Christ. So whatever you have, you have in Christ. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. For those who are in Christ, there is now no condemnation. You belong to the Lord. Holy blameless, a new creation, a saint redeemed, washed by the blood of the Lamb, you have overcome the world because you are in Christ. So fourth, you are strong and the word of God abides in you. The reason we can overcome temptation is because the word of God abides in us. We are not strong in ourselves. We are strong because we live in and through the word of God. When we hold fast to the world, to the word, allowing it to do its work on our heart and mind, we can overcome the evil one. When Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by the evil one, Jesus responded to the devil's temptation each time by saying, it is written. Demon, Jesus demonstrated for us how to overcome evil. We overcome evil by the word of God. This is what happens every single week. What we, what we try to do in our services, we, we come, we sing God's praises, we confess our sins, we, are, we remind ourselves of our forgiveness, and then the word of God goes forth, forming and, and molding us into his image so that we can overcome the sin in our life. We desperately need the word of God each and every week. So Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We are strong in the Lord when we are strong in the word. It, it lights our way, as the great hymn of the faith states. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who trust and obey. Trust and obey, there is no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Beloved, be happy in Jesus. Love one another. Walk in the light. Obey his word. And when you are tempted to doubt God's love for you, when you are tempted to, to live in the weight of condemnation, you have to remember that there was a love letter written to you. I am writing to you that your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you that you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you that you know the Father. I am writing to you because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not believe the devil's lies. Believe the word of God. God has written his love for you. Never, let, never forget his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Well, fifth and finally, we are God's letter written to the world. What you see here is you see John writing a letter to the church. So the church would be a, a sweet reflection of the gospel of Christ. Well, guess what? Now God is writing that word on you, to you so you would go from this place so that the world could read you. This is what Paul kind of makes the same point in 2 Corinthians 3. You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read 
by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. What I want, what I pray happens in our church. I I pray that the word of God has such a radical transforming effect in how we love one another. That we are built up day, week in and week out by the word of God. That when we leave this place, people watch our lives. People read how we we live and how we function. And they see our lives and therefore they know Christ. They know Christ's love because they see our love for one another. I pray that people would see us, how we live and how we interact, how we are self-sacrificial, radically loving one another. They would see our great love for one another and would ask ourselves, who is their God? And we would be able to say, we belong to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, who while we were yet sinners died for us and was raised to give us eternal life. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. People are going to read your life. Let's just make sure they read the right message, that we belong to Christ and Christ alone. Heavenly Father, we thank you for writing to us of your great love for us in Christ. We thank you that we have our sins forgiven on account of your namesake. We thank you that we know the Father. We thank you that we are strong, the word of God abides in us, and that we have overcome the world. Father, we have done all that, not on our own accord, but because of what you have done for us in Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would, you would make us believe that message so deeply that we would truly love one another, that the world may see our love for one another, and they may see you because of it. So God, we pray you would deepen our love so that the world may know you are real. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.